Let's pray together this morning. God, as we get ready to open up your word today, God, we have very strong beliefs about the power that is inherent in it, that you send it out with a promise, a promise to do what you intended with it, that it would not return to you void, a promise with a purpose attached, that it would accomplish exactly what you desire. And Lord, I pray that we would hear what you're saying to us. God, I pray that we'd both be able to hear with a, a collective sense of hearing, spiritual hearing, what you're saying to our hearts. God, we also hear very personally and individually what you're saying to us uniquely, what we each personally need to hear. And God, I pray that the message would not stop at the hearing. That God would continue to the understanding deeply, personal application of it, and to the doing. And God, in so doing that, I pray that you'd be honored, that you'd be pleased. Lord, that's what we want most. We want you to be glorified, both in our lives, that you look at us and you're pleased with what we do and how we live. And God, that you'd be glorified out in this community and in this world. People that don't know you, we want them to know you. We want them to worship you like we've been worshiping you. We want them to be able to say of you like we have said of you, that you're an almighty God and there's none like you. And Lord, that's our aim. That's, that's our goal. That's our purpose. That's our heart. So Lord, I pray you'd work through today and through our service to accomplish those things in us. So God, we just want to yield to you. We want your spirit to prevail here today. Lord, we want what you want to be done to be done for your glory and for our good. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. How about opening your Bible this morning to Philippians chapter 1? We're going to look at the end, end of Philippians chapter 1 and bridge over to the beginning of chapter 2. And this, this continuous line of thought here that Paul is leaving for the church at Philippi. And, and, and let me give you just a little bit of background and context again. Some of this will be somewhat of a review. But I want to make sure that we see the big picture of this so we can see how this all plays out and the impact of it for us. Paul has just finished sharing with the Philippians. Now, this is a brand new congregation. This is a gateway city to the Roman Empire where the church is going to blossom and bloom. God had orchestrated all of this. We've seen already how God had detoured Paul and his life to send him to this place for this particular time so that people there would get saved, people like Lydia outside the city gates and soldiers within city gates, and then a church would be birthed there, and all this was part of God's will for them, and, and not just for them, and that's something you need to consider. When, when God saved us, when God saved you, when God began to work in your life, it was for your good and His glory in your life, but it was more than that. It was for what God would do through you. It was to open up doors for the gospel to go way beyond us, and it's much, much bigger than us. And so in the context of all this, Paul has already shared with them about how God works through suffering. Paul's personal suffering, the imprisonment and the hardships and the arrests and the beatings and all those things. In fact, he said this turned out to be actually for, for the good of the gospel. Because of what Paul had endured, people became bolder. People began to talk about Christ. And, and for good or for bad, the conversation about Jesus was everywhere, and that was a great thing. And Paul knew about the hardship that the church would be birthed in. He knew about the opposition that a true church would experience. These are things that Jesus has shared often with his disciples. You know, as the world hated me, they're going to hate you. As the world opposed me, they're going to oppose you. As they resisted me, they're going to resist you. Every time a church is true to the cause of Christ and to the exclusivity of Christ, that's going to draw resistance because the world doesn't want to hear that. We live in a world of some sort of bizarro tolerance today that says whatever you choose to believe is equal to whatever I choose to believe, and there's no defining lines between what's true and what's false, and a true church is always going to stand opposed to that. And so in the context of this, we looked at the importance of our own authenticity, that we live in a way that shows the gospel to be true, that we show the effects of the gospel in our, in our daily lives. The word itself is true, and whatever you do or whatever I do can't undermine that. It can't change the truth of the gospel, but it sure can lessen the impact of it on a person's life who sees in us something different than what we say, different than what we claim. So Paul says in Philippians 1.27, he says, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. If I were summarizing that, I would say, does your life look like a life that's been changed by the power of God? Is the gospel real in us? He says, let your life be this way so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. That's a powerful statement of what a unified church looks like. One spirit, one mind, side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you 
that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Listen to some of the terminology that Paul used there. You can circle these words in your notes. Look at what he says. He says, it's been granted to you that you would not just believe. That's a great gift. The gift of God that we would believe unto salvation is huge. He said, here's another gift I've given you that you might not consider a gift. And that's that you would suffer for my sake. Because in suffering for Christ, we know so much more clearly what we believe and why we believe it. And our faith becomes so much more precious to us. And also in those times of great pressure and difficulty and opposition, the truth of who Christ is and what Christ has done for us becomes so much more evident. How you follow Christ in the midst of hardship and pain gives such great credence to what you say about Him. It's in those moments where it's proven to be true and real and the world takes notice. And it's often only through pain and difficulty that people ever hear or see who Christ really is. And so Paul says it's been granted to us to suffer. He says you're going to have opponents, you're going to suffer, you're going to be engaged in conflict. All those are the external pressures that this world and the God of this age, Satan, is going to put on a true church. He's going to cause the world to come against the true church. And look at verse 1 of chapter 2. So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind. Now here's something that is an absolute given. It's been a given since the time of Christ. It'll be a given until Christ returns. True Christianity, the authentic church, is always going to face opposition. It's a given. It always has. It always will. Jesus said that. He said that we should be prepared, to that, prepared for that. Paul said it's been granted to us for, to suffer. That's a special, unique gift that God gives us with special and unique rewards to it. Opposition is going to come. And you and I don't have to look very far for this opposition. You pick up today's headlines, you'll see something somewhere about the church being opposed. You read anything on the internet, read the stories that come across, and you're going to see the church being opposed, churches being picketed, uh, the opposition of the world against the message that we believe Jesus Christ is the sole means to God. That's a very unpopular message with the world of many religions. That we have certain religious values, certain moral values that we hold to. Very, very unpopular in the day and age that we live. The true church is always going to be opposed. The more we take the message of the, of the gospel outside these walls, the more we're going to feel the pressure of the world against us. But here's something you need to know about that, and I, and I know that you do. There's nothing that this world can do, and there's nothing that our enemy can mount against us that can stop the advance of God's church. Jesus said this. He said, this church, this truth, as he talked to his disciples, telling them about the true gospel, who he really was, he said, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. There's nothing the enemy can do. We are not to put up gates to keep the world out. We're to crash through the gates of the enemy, knowing that there's nothing the enemy can put up to oppose the church that's going to withhold it, withstand it. And here's something else we need to know. Since the time of Christ, the more violent, the more virulent the opposition is to the church, the greater its growth. Wherever there have been martyrs, wherever there have been people who have suffered for the cause, the church has blossomed in those places. There are more evangelical Christians today in China than there are in Europe. It's, it's shocking what God is doing in some of these places where the opposition is most strident against the church. But wherever it's been opposed by the world, miraculous growth comes. Why? Because the truth shows up. And people's convictions become very real to them. And if you're going to share the gospel in the face of persecution, hardship, imprisonment, even death, you know for sure you really believe it. No, the world can't stop what the church is doing. That's a given. But there's a greater threat to a healthy, vibrant, prevailing church than what's outside our doors. The greater threat is really what's within. It's the internal conflict. It's the internal strife. It's the internal discord. It's all the things that we do to ourselves and among ourselves that undermines the real work of the church. Satan is a defeated foe. The guarantee of the end has already been given to us. We know the promise of Christ in a prevailing church. We know that. The only way a church is going to be defeated and lose its lampstand or its ability to be a witness for Christ in its community and its context is if it turns on itself. And that's what Paul is really addressing here. Look, he, he speaks of these external oppositions, but in the context of that, what does he say that the church needs to be? The church needs to be of one spirit, one mind, side by side. I want you to think of that imagery. I want think of this sort of spiritual battlefield imagery of going into conflict with arms locked, 
Now, how many of you are old enough to remember playing a game when you could play games like this at school? In PE or recess, where you played Red Rover, Red Rover. Any of you ever play that game? Remember what I'm talking about? That is not politically correct today because you know, can't be making contact, knocking kids down and stuff like that. that didn't, you know, everybody's got to be a winner today. I get it. It's different now. But when we were kids, you line up in two big lines and you locked hands and arms as closely as you could and you called for someone to come running over with the intent of knocking you down or busting through your line, right? And the whole goal is to withstand. That's what the church has got to do. The church has got to be consciously aware that we've got to lock arms. We've got to unite in purpose and in heart and do what God wants us to do because there are enemies. But we've got to be aware that the biggest enemy is the weakness in our own ranks. The links in our own chain. It's when people begin to turn against each other. That's when a church really begins to struggle. There are so many threats to unity in a church. Bigger than what's outside. I'm not concerned what the enemy throws at us. doesn't mean the enemy is not real. It doesn't mean we're not engaged in spiritual warfare. It doesn't mean that we don't need to pray or be vigilant. But I know he's a defeated foe. I'm more concerned about what we would do to ourselves that would undermine the work of God in us. I did some research over the last couple of weeks. Or what are the most common causes? What are the most common elements that are being written about that are challenges to a church's unity, to a church's togetherness, to its cohesiveness and effectiveness? And these are the sort of my own top ten based on some generic research I've done. One is, is change. Change is a, is a disruptor for folks. We get into a, a place where we're comfortable with a certain thing, with a certain flow, a certain way, a certain procedure, a certain type. Any type of change is, is always a, a challenge to us. It's a challenge to us personally. My family's going through a lot of, of transition and change. To be in one place for a long, long time, one culture, one community, one context for a long, long time is, is, a, is, a, is a big challenge. It creates pressures and difficulties. Competing values is a big challenge for a church. Competing values are when, when people see different things as more important than other people. You know, I think the most important thing the church can be doing is this, so I want our resources and time focused this way. Another person says, well, I think it should be more of this, and so our time and attention is focused this way. And Each of us have a different perception of things that are valuable. I hope as God does a collective work in us, more and more we begin to see priorities the same, values the same. Um, and we begin to see that as an outward focus. One of my goals and hopes for our church is that we begin to see, and we have debates and discussions down the road simply on how are we going to give more of ourselves away? How are we going to do more of what God wants us to do? How are we going to focus our resources and turn them outward? Miscommunication is a big threat to unity. When people are hearing or perceiving different things, I was reading this this week, which is a big challenge to someone who essentially speaks for a living, that sometimes uh, people only will, will process about 10 to 15% of what you're actually saying. And because your mind can actually, some of you say I talk fast, but actually your mind works faster than I talk. You're already ahead of me sometimes thinking what I might be saying or what you think I'm saying. And sometimes we're already figuring out a retort or reply or response to that. So what we do psychologically is we hear 10 to 15% of what's being said. We assume another 50% or so. And the rest of the time is our response to that already. So we're not catching it all. Miscommunication can be huge. Some of you may have noticed this week in our church newsletter, I asked Pastor Dixon of our Spanish mission to put in there just a statement, a brief article, how our Spanish church is doing. Um, one, because I wanted you to know how they were doing, and that's good so you can remember to pray for them. But two, because the rumor had spread that we no longer had a Spanish mission. And so I thought, well, you know, there's a great example of a discordant discommunication that has no basis in reality that people need to hear. Miscommunication can do that. Be careful what you say. Be careful what you communicate to make sure it's true. Number four is a lack of shared vision can be a huge one. We just, we aren't after the same things. We're not wanting the same things. It's very natural for us over time. It's what every church does. It's not unique to Calvary. Every church, unless it's consciously checking against this, moving against this, will turn inward. What do we want? What do we like? What serves us? We have to consciously be focusing on what is service? What does the community need? What about those people who don't know Christ yet? What about the people who are not here? You know, the church is the only institutional organization in the world that doesn't exist for itself. It actually exists for those who are not yet part of it. We have to consciously think in those terms. Fear of the future can be a big one. We can eat ourselves up with the what-ifs and what-abouts, and I'm not sure how this is going to be, and worrying about tomorrow and all those things. Unresolved conflict is a big issue for churches. Things that have festered under the surface for a long time, things that have never been dealt with biblically, Conversations that have never been had face to face, forgiveness that's never been given, issues never discussed. Complaining and murmuring is a huge one. It's been true ever since the beginning of recorded time in, in Scripture. 
Even under the greatest leader that Israel ever had, they complained about him. I don't know who the Israelites thought they would have done better with than Moses, but they complained and murmured about Moses. Even when God had delivered them out of 400 years of slavery and abuse, some of them said, we want to go back. It's, it's just human nature to, to find something to find fault with. Complaining and murmuring was a biblical issue. It still is. Questionable theology can be a divisive issue for a church. And some of you have seen that and experienced that in your own life where either the theology, theology became so liberal that you couldn't match it to the Scriptures anymore or it became aberrant where it didn't seem to be fitting with what you knew to be true or it seemed to be creating conflict. Unforgiveness and bitterness is huge. I was sharing with someone this week that bitterness is probably the most effective bait that Satan has ever used to combat God's people. He throws it out there, this offense. Aren't you offended about, by that? Doesn't that bother you that they said that? Doesn't, doesn't that make you angry? Aren't you? And we try to cloak it in spiritual terms, but being easily offended is not a spiritual trait. That's not a gift of the Spirit or fruit of the Spirit. But Satan throws these things out there like a bait for us. Oh, I'm going to get offended by, by that. I'm going to get my feelings hurt by that. I'm going to be upset by that. And then as soon as we bite that hook, he's got us. And that root of bitterness, sorry for mixing my metaphors there between hooks and roots and all that, but you can follow. That root of bitterness begins to grow in us and he knows we no longer are effective for his cause. And then sometimes just plain selfishness. And that's what Paul is addressing here. It can't be about you. It's got to be about something bigger than you. So it's a cause bigger than us. What Paul is saying in essence here is your disagreements, your conflicts, they reveal spiritual problems in the fellowship. They, they reveal issues of the heart of what we believe about God and what God is doing in us and what we believe about our purpose. And the only way they're going to be solved is not by more rules, not by, not by threats, not even by telling you pragmatically, here's why it's got to be done or else things aren't going to work well. The only way it's going to be solved is for God to do a heart work in us. And that's an important thing for us to see in this passage. Paul never lays out any of the effects of lack of unity or discord. He doesn't say when you get together, your worship services are going to be compromised, though they will. He doesn't say your effectiveness at reaching your friends and neighbors is going to be compromised, though it will. He, he won't say that your joy is going to be sucked out, although he does say at the end, make my joy complete, so that certainly is implied, though it will. What he speaks of is entirely on spiritual terms. He appeals to a very deeper level. Because the only way to fix issues of conflict and discord is to go right to the heart and remind folks of who Christ is and what he's done for us. Remind us of who we are in Christ and what that means to us now that changes hearts and lives. Look at his motivations that he shares here. <clears throat> motivations. First one, he says, if there is any encouragement in Christ. And it, he, he almost starts on the most basic level. Is there any encouragement in Christ in you? Is your life any different because you've met Christ? Has that changed you in any way? Has there been an effect of, of encouragement, of joy, of saying, you know what, I used to be this and now I'm this? Because that supersedes everything else. That recognition that, you know what, before I met Christ, I was in darkness. And that darkness meant I was an alien to the country and family of God. And I was an enemy of God, even separated from God. And I was lost in my sins and all these other ways that Scripture describes that. But the greatest joy that we could find is to know that we're forgiven, to know that we're in Christ. What does that mean in the context of a healthy church? Look what Christ has done for us. Is there any encouragement in that? He said, is there any comfort from love? How has how how Christ loved us? And again, this may seem basic to you on a simple level, but this is the level that we've got to appeal to in order to be unified. Is there any comfort in love? Sometimes when I'm challenged to be forgiving, sometimes when it's, when it's hard to be loving to somebody, sometimes when it's easier to keep a score than it is to let it go, I have to remind myself, to what degree have I been forgiven? How, how has God exhibited patience and mercy and grace in my life? How many times have I come to Him in, in confession of the same sins, the, the same failures? How often has He been aware of my weakness? How has He loved me and accepted me? And how often have I not reflected that same to others? Because the one who's been forgiven much forgives much. The one who understands much forgiveness is much more forgiving. And, and the... I begin to realize that the more bitter I become and the less forgiving I am and the more calloused I become, the farther I am away from understanding and remembering the goodness of Christ. Is there any, is there any comfort of love? 
the unconditional love of Christ, how does that affect our relationships with each other? How on the one hand can we celebrate His incredible mercy towards us, His incredible goodness towards us, His willingness to forgive and and accept us regardless and at the same time be unmerciful, unforgiving, easily offended, always looking for wrong, always looking for something to find fault with. Those two do not coexist. This third affirmation and motivation is the participation in the Spirit. The word there is koinon. It's where we get the word koinonia or fellowship. It's the biblical idea of people in deep relationship with each other. Fellowship is not like when you come together and everybody brings their favorite meal or, you know, it's not a covered dish event. Um, It's not ice cream social. Fellowship is people who are in relationship with one another for the mutual benefit of the people, that we care about each other. We care about their relationship with Christ. We care about their families. We care about their kids. We care about how they're doing. We care about how they're doing morally and spiritually in their relationship with God. The word fellowship here is so embedded in all of this discussion in Philippians. It goes back to verse 5 of chapter 1, where Paul calls them partners in the gospel. It's the same word, fellowship in the gospel, that coin on, that we are connected. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Paul says, In one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves are free, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. That's koinon. That's a connection made by God. I wonder sometimes how all those people in church life who've fallen out with each other and fallen into conflict, what are they going to do when God expects a reconciliation for eternity? You know, we are bound together by something bigger than us, bigger than our differences, bigger than our different backgrounds, bigger than, than our life experiences, bigger than our race, our age, our personal economy. We're bound together in this, in Christ, one fellowship. Is there any participation in that? And again, it's basic theology, but it's something we need to consider. When God saved us, He planted His Spirit in us to guide us into living a life that pleases Him. His Spirit is our teacher. It is our comforter. It is our strength, our source of power. It is the center of of transformation in us. We don't become like Christ with self-effort. We become like Christ through the power of the Spirit in us. But we all have the same Spirit. And the Spirit's not working at ends with itself. The Spirit of Christ in me will not be in opposition to the Spirit of Christ in you. But it will be working for the greater good of God's church and God's glory, ultimately. And so that's the participation in the Spirit. We're either participating in that or we're in opposition to that. Those are only two choices. And then he says, what about affection and sympathy? This appeals right to our emotions, to our hearts. Affection and sympathy. Is there any sort of love in you for others that matches the love I have for you? From Christ's perspective. Is, has that changed you? Has it changed your heart? It's like Jesus taught in the greatest sermon of all, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 7. Blessed are those who are merciful, for they shall receive mercy or obtain mercy. How has what Christ's done in us changed us outwardly? It's an important consideration. It's very practical. It's not just theological. It's not just a, a hypothetical consideration. If God's love for me has changed me, how will I express that towards others? Is there any affection and sympathy? And again, these motivations are all spiritual. They're not pragmatic. He's not appealing to success, although he could. He's not saying you won't be healthy without it. You you won't be vital without it. You won't be successful at at growth without it. You won't do well in the community without it. All all those things are true. It wasn't just about success. It was about hearts. Hearts that reflect Christ. Why? Because he says this is our goal. Look at those verses again. Chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. So if these things are there, encouragement in Christ, comfort from love, participation in the Spirit, affection and sympathy, since those are there, because this is what Christ does in us, complete my joy by doing this. Be of the same mind. Have the same love. Be in full accord in one mind. Let's look at those concepts for a minute. Same mind, one mind. The, the book ends there. The same mind, one mind. Because of our common experience with Christ, because we, we have been saved together by the same process. You haven't been saved differently than I've been saved. You don't have a different spirit than I have. God's done a work in us individually that is for a collective end, to build His body, to build His church for His glory. Because of that, we are now supposed to be like-minded. And the word here that we translate like-minded is the exact same word in the Greek that you find in chapter 2, verse 5, that is translated attitude. In other words, this same mind, one mind, this is an attitude. This is the way we perceive things. It's not saying that we're going to be uniform. We don't all have to be the same. We don't have to think the same. 
We, we don't have to love all the same things. And God has put a church together in the way He sees fit with different spiritual gifts and different passions. And that's why we're able to do different things because God puts in the hearts of people to do those things. But one thing we have is the a, is a same mindset, a similar attitude. And we'll look at this next week. That attitude ultimately is marked by this word. I'll give you sort of the segue to next week. Humility. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What was the mindset of Christ Jesus? Who, though he was in heaven, worshipped as God, considered that not to be something to be clung to or to be grasped. But instead, he made himself as a servant for us. And isn't that the exact same lesson he taught his disciples, the, the last most poignant message he gave them? They're sitting around in a room, and they're all waiting and looking for this non-existent servant to show up to wash all their feet, remember? And they're each looking about, wondering, and, and you can just imagine what's spinning in their minds. I'm not washing your feet. I'm above you. If I'm not above you, I should be above you. And, you know, I'm more valuable than you, and I'm a leader in this group, and, you know, no way, no one's, I'm, not, I'm not submitting myself to anyone in this room. I'm, I'm holding out for my spot, for my position, for my selfishness. Until Jesus takes off his outer garment, until Jesus puts a towel around his waist, until Jesus gets the wash basin and starts washing their feet, and they learn a very, very powerful lesson that moment. That the one who is servant of all is the greatest of all. It's a different economy with God. And so this attitude, this attitude of humility that says, you know what, I'm not here to make sure that I get what I want. I'm not here to make sure that everything pleases me. I'm never dissatisfied with anything. I'm here to serve Christ by serving God's people. And if that means what I want doesn't happen, if that means I have to be selfless, if that means I have to let go of something that means something to me, if that means I have to put myself under someone else, then that's what I do because that's what reflects Christ and that's pleasing Christ. It's an attitude. The same love. That's an affection. That's something that stirs in the heart. Paul wanted the church to have the same love. And we see this in, in the rest of this chapter. We'll look at this a little bit more through, as we go through chapter 2 and, and how we treat each other. We ought to have the same love for each other that Christ had for us. And this ought to affect the way that we deal with one another. By this will all men know that you're my disciples. How? You have love one for another. This, this one thing will be the identifying mark how you love each other will show the reality of your faith. It'll show whether this gospel is true to you or not. It'll show whether you've ever received it to yourself or not. It'll show whether you're obedient to Christ or not. It'll show whether you're faithful to Him or not. How you love one another. He says, I want you to have the same love. And that's a contagious thing. And not only loving each other, because it's not a selfish love. It's not an exclusive love. It's not, hey, we just love us and love people like us. It's a love like Christ. that We love those people who are hard to love, those people who don't want our love, we love the people that Christ loves. And so we want to spread that love as we go. And then full accord. Full accord's an action. Full accord is what you do now. This is, not a, this is not a lot of people packed into a small car, okay? This is a lot of people doing the same things together. Full accord. It's that we have now. We have a mindset that says, it's not about me. It's not about serve us. It's about service. It's a heart. It's a heart that's full of love for Christ because Christ loved us and so I want to love people. But now that just doesn't leave me with thinking and feeling. It's got to leave me with doing. And that's what it means to, to, to be in full accord. Jesus prayed for this sort of unity. John 17, 22. You remember Jesus' high priestly prayer for us, for His disciples then, and all who would be His disciples? Go back and reread John 17 if you want to see the heart of Jesus for His people and for His church. And in verse 22, He says, I pray that they may be one, Father, as You and I are one. He knew that the enemy was going to come. He had told the church that. He told them to be prepared. You know, some would be imprisoned. Some would be beaten. Most would be martyred. But what he prayed for mostly was that, that they would have unity. And so as we stand firm in the Spirit, in spite of all of our differences, that early church in Philippi would have Jews who converted to follow Christ. It would have people who were immersed in that Roman religion of many gods. It had some who would worship Caesar as a god. It had many total unbelievers, pagans. It had a mix of all these different people and they had one thing in common that transcended language and ethnicity and, and any other demographic factor. They had Christ. And they had one purpose as a result. He says, you know, I want you to have these, these attitudes. I want you to have these affections. I want you to have these actions because this is the goal, that you would glorify God, that you would bring God much attention by living out what you believe and sharing what you believe boldly everywhere you go. And the purpose of the church has never changed. It's never changed from that. What really motivates us? And we'll talk about this a little bit tonight. I hope you'll come tonight. 
I hate to give a commercial from old message, but I feel good about this one, so I want you to come. Here's what really stirs the hearts of God's people throughout the ages. And this is what has always been a, a stirring that brings about revival. Is is when you're out there in the community, or you're flipping through your channels, or you're reading through the paper, or you're just having a conversation with someone who just spiritually just doesn't get it, and it hurts deep in your heart that it's like this. That something burns in you saying, it should not be this way. This world ought not be this way. There is a great and glorious God, the one we just sang about. There is none like you. There's a great and glorious God that people don't know, and they don't honor, and they don't recognize, and we want them to know Him. Our goal is not to build a big church. God will build His church as He sees fit. God is doing glorious things through little churches and big churches and all things in between all over the world. And our size has nothing to do with it. Gideon learned that lesson right off the bat. And, and our goal is not to have a great reputation for ourselves, so us being of good repute helps the cause of Christ. Our goal is that people would know Him, this one true God. And so what stirs us is, God, you're not being glorified, and you're not being worshipped. And so the reason that motivates us to share who you are and how you get to you through Jesus Christ is so that people could know you like we know you, so you could get the glory that you deserve, so you could get the honor that you deserve, and so that people could have the experience with you that, that we have. So that's what motivates us. And you see this purpose played out in the last few verses here of this, of this, first, of this second chapter. Look what he says in verse 10. He's talked about opposition from the outside, pain and suffering. He's talking about unity in one heart, one accord, one mind, all those things from the inside. But it all leads to this point. It's for a reason. So that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know what? God saved you so you would bring Him glory. He saved you so that for all eternity, you would say you're a great and glorious God. You would never stop worshiping Him and honoring Him. And the reason He wants to use this church and use Christians like us, is for His glory. So that people and nations would turn to Him and, and honor Him and worship Him. Why is He desiring every knee to bow and every tongue to confess? Because He wants to be glorified. And always know this, wherever God is glorified, it's for the good of those who glorify Him. Always. It's always for the good of us to know Him in that way. And so, here's our purpose. That everyone would know Christ and honor Him and glorify Him. And here's how God's going to do it. He's going to do it through people who fit the description of Philippians 2.15. That you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. You know what will make you shine bright in dark places? You know what will show you to be straight and different from everyone who is crooked and twisted? You know what will give the message so much power and credibility is that when you love each other, when you're committed to each other, when you serve each other, when you don't allow the kind of saint, the stuff that divides people in this world, you know, people all over the world find conflict easy and find offenses at the, at the ready and, and find problems to complain about everywhere. That's what the world does. You know, we complain about, you know, how we got our hair cut and the, and the lady who checked me out at the, at the store and, and the person in traffic and, and the slowness of the delivery of my food and the temperature of my french fry. I mean, we, that's the world. That's the world. That's not Christ. And that's not the church. He says, I want you to be different. I want you to shine as lights in this world. If God is going to be glorified, if people are going to come to know the God that we love and glorify Him, we're going to have to be unified. And when we become unified, when our hearts are connected and our attitudes are right towards each other and right towards Him, and we've got a sense of purpose and goal that we're all heading towards, and we're going to shine. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. You can't put a bush on cover up that kind of light. That won't be a program. That, that, that won't be a particular strategy with a catchy name. That won't be a new book or pamphlet. That will be the old-time way that God established from the beginning. Love each other. Live right. Honor me. Show yourselves to be different. And then every time you open your mouth to talk about me, there'll be credibility behind it. And there'll be power behind it. Neil Moody is one of my all-time favorites. I would encourage you to read his, his biography. Very powerful biography. Lyle Dorsett wrote a powerful biography of D.L. Moody. 
Yo Moody said this. He said, there's two ways I know of that churches become unified. He said, one, they can become frozen together. He said, or two, they become melted together. I pray that God will melt us together. That He'll melt what is hard. He'll thaw what is cold. He'll repair what is broken. He'll unite what is separated. In the process of all of this healing, God will bring our hearts together. And put our attitudes are right. And we'll say, this is what we're here for. We're going to lock arms to do this. We're going to be side by side for the cause of this. And we're not going to let any enemy, within or without, keep us from being light shining in a dark world. And that's what God wants for us. I'm going to ask if you just bow your heads with me and close your eyes as we pray together. I want you to ask God this.